So well, welcome everyone, and uh, today uh, we're honored to have uh, Julius uh, Pilatus from uh, uh, King's College of London. Uh, he's in Department of Chemistry. He's now a senior lecturer, and uh, he had his PhD from uh, National Technical University of Athens, and then he went to do a postdoc with uh, Professor Karen Robinson, and uh, that's when I knew his work, uh, his very exciting work, uh, integrating uh, mass spectrometry data to structural biology. Uh, through modeling uh, techniques, and uh, more recently at uh, King's College London, he has been focusing on uh, using hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry to study membrane proteins. And uh, he has uh, done a lot of great work and uh, have a lot of great publications. And uh, recently, he also was uh, uh, the EPSRC fellow, which is the uh, uh, British uh, Engineering and Physical Science Research Council. So he's doing great work, and uh, we're happy to have him here today to talk about uh, how he uses the HDX mass spec to study membrane proteins. And uh, welcome, uh, Agris, and the floor is yours. Okay, thanks so much for the introduction, and, and thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to present my work to your institute. And uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about the work we've been doing the last few years in my group, and that's using different biochemical methods in combination with hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry, but also computational uh, tools in order to understand the functional dynamics of membrane proteins. But why were we interested in membrane in, in functional dynamics? So usually the, the traditional techniques, we can, uh, we can have static pictures of different uh, of proteins. So we can have individual uh, pictures, but however, it's very often that we don't know the sequence of events, or we don't know even we don't have many of these pictures, or just have met one picture or one snapshot of proteins. Uh, and in that way, we're missing a lot of information. We're missing information about how they work and how they operate. And we're trying to put together these individual pictures in order to create movies, in order to understand how proteins function. So building molecular movies, for instance, here I give you an example of membrane transporters. They, they operate by alternating axes from one side of the membrane to the other side of the membrane and having information of as many states as possible. As you can see on the left, uh, in the left side of the, of the screen, we can build together an understanding of the structural dynamics uh, of membrane proteins and have underpinning the functional mechanisms. So the key aim here is that to, to gain a full picture of membrane proteins on how they work and how they operate. So over the last uh, 20 years, I would say, we have an exponential increase in, in the number of structures that have been deposited in the relevant databases. And that's based on techniques like crystal structures, crystallography, or, uh, and more recently on the like uh, breakthroughs in cryo electron microscopy. And even more recently with a, a structure prediction with alpha fold, we, ha we can have a very good understanding of structures. What we're missing currently is like experimental tools that we can actually tell us about the, the dynamics and, the, and, the, and how the dynamics they operate, how they move in, 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 into the cell. So, why are we interested in membrane proteins? So membrane proteins are code for about a third of a human genome, but they are like the targets of about two thirds of known drugs. So membrane proteins are very important for drug development. So the key targets, as I said, and they, they function by, they, they, their function is modulated both by substrates and drugs, but also by the surrounding environment. That's the, the, the interactions with lipids, with which surrounds these membrane proteins. So building tools to understand the mechanism of membrane proteins can lead to better understanding of how uh, drugs move, how, how drugs function, and that can lead us eventually to uh, design better and more rational drugs. So membrane proteins are important but challenging targets. They are the gateways to the cell. They consist of a mixture of uh, um, they, they embedded into a, a lipid by layers of lipids uh, that makes them quite a heterogeneous environment. And that way, it's very difficult to study by traditional tools. 
So the lipids are important because they modulate the structure and function of membrane proteins. They're not just uh, 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 inactive, but they have a role in, in order modulating the function and the composition, but also like the interactions of, of proteins with lipids can have a significant effect into the membrane protein function. So here the key biological question that over the last few years we want to answer is like, how does the lipid environment modulate membrane protein function? And that's by interacting with membrane proteins and through indirect uh, interactions, which can be the composition of the surrounding environment. So this kind of information can lead to understanding regulatory mechanisms underpinning membrane protein function and the key uh, proteins, key classes of proteins that we target in, in my group are the membrane transporters, but also more lately, trying to understand the selectivity and specificity of G-protein coupled receptors. So, as I said, we we talk we we start we study uh, transporters. One of the uh, one of the classes that we have been using primarily as model system in in my groups are the the sugar transporters, and that's the bacterial xylee, and and also we're trying to go into uh, its its homologue, the human. A counterpart that's a GLUT1, and GLUT1 is important target because it's related to the GLUT1 deficiency syndrome with clinical symptoms such as seizures and microcephaly. We've also been studying uh, transporters, uh, flux pumps, such as the those involved in the antimicrobial resistance, that's like uh, systems like ACRB and MACB. As you, you might know that the uh, antimicrobial resistance is one of the major threats to human health and that uh, has a, a significant cost uh, currently in, in health systems. And uh, g protein couple receptors we've been targeting as model systems that the beta-1 adrenergic receptor and the neurotensive receptor, and these are like systems that implicate into cardiac diseases and they have been, uh, uh, they have been related or linked to drugs for heart failures such as the beta blockers. So the main areas that we're looking into understanding a bit more uh, detail is like ligand induced structural dynamics. So we want to understand how, the, keep, get a bit more better understanding of, of the mechanisms that pertaining the transport cycles and also the regular conformation mechanisms of transporters. So getting a bit of better picture of the dynamics and how they interacting with substrate inhibitors, but also with lipids. So the lipids, we want to see how first where they bind. Do they bind to specific uh, protein uh, transporter areas? And how this lipid binding can affect the, the conformation dynamics, but also the function of these proteins. And finally, we want to also see how where is the binding site of specific drugs, and whether these drugs are associated with any uh, structural changes and any dynamical changes. So for these questions that I've just described to you, so we're using a technique that is called hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry. Some of you might be familiar with mass spectrometry. So I will try to briefly explain how that works. So I, I start with a little bit about the advantages of, of uh, HTX mass spectrometry. It's, it's a quite a fast experiment we can, we can do uh, in general. I guess compared to other structural biology methods such as cryo-M or crystallography, it's relatively fast. So they can tolerate heterogeneous environments. So basically we can carry out experiments within uh, like co uh, heterogeneous compositions, for instance, lipid environments such as nanodisks, but also like uh, SMOPs, which is more re realistic. But in, in some cases, we can do in situ or in cell experiments. Uh, but that, that requires quite significant technology development. So another, another uh, advantage of the method is that in, in theory, they can, 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 we can do experiments in high megadalton protein complexes, although that will require significant developments on how we analyze the data. So, I would say that both the neck and the HDX mass spectrometry is not too much the experiment themselves, but more, more like the, 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 the amount of data we amass and how we can analyze it in a, in a timely manner. That's why it's important to have also developing at the same time software that can actually make our lives easier. So 
how it works. So we prepare the protein and in solution. And usually we, we carry out differential experiments, at least in, in my group. So we have like two states, a state that we are interested, for instance, the a drug bound state and the unbound state. So the unbound state is used as a reference trait. So by doing this differential experiment, we can map what is the effect of the, of the drug or substrate binding to a protein. Then we deuterate our samples for different time points. Usually that can last for seconds up to hours. Then we quench the reaction by lowering the pH and the temperature. And then we digest the protein using, uh, for instance, pepsin as a protease. And then we carry out LC and then mass spectrometry in order to uh, understand, in order to monitor the, the changes of the, the uptake of deuterium on the am amide uh, hydrogens. So in that way, we can, we can probe the structural dynamics of proteins. And more importantly, another advantage of this method is that we can, we can carry out experiments without covalent modification of proteins, which can require quite a, a number of uh, uh, tedious biochemical control experiments. So the, the exchange of hydrogen to deuterium uh, it's, we, we're looking only on the amide hydrogens, which exchange from milliseconds to hours. So the, the side chains also exchange from hydrogen to deuterium, but this exchange happens very fast that was impossible to, to monitor with the time scales that we can carry out the experiments. So uh, dynamic regions, such as, so, such as those, the solvent exposed regions, the loops, for instance, within the proteins, they exchange readily, but the structural regions which involved in H bonding, such as alpha helices, the beta seeds, the exchange more slowly. That's why we carry out experiments with different time points. So starting from seconds up to hours, so we can carry the effect, we can, we can understand the effect of different regions within a, a protein. So the last few years, we in my group, we worked on developing tools and methods to understand how the lipids modulate the dynamic of membrane proteins. So in order to achieve that, we wanted to have like a, a, a workflow where we can actually carry out experiments in, 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 in lipid-based environments. So what we did is like we, we expressed the proteins and then reconstituted into, into lipid nanodisks. So we, for instance, in this case, we, we carry out experiments on transporters and then reconstituted in transporters into uh, nanodisks where we, mod we change the lipid composition. Uh, we have, for instance, lipid A and lipid B composition. So usually in our experiments, we, we modulate it, we change the composition by one lipid. So in that case, we can, have a, we can, carry, we can carry experiments and understand the effect of these specific lipids. So then we deuterated the, uh, our samples, again, differential experiments, then the quench, the reaction. And the new step that we introduced here is that we need to get rid of the lipids before we go down to enzymatic digestion. And the reason for doing that is because we, we, want to, we don't want to carry out analysis on lipids because they can convolute the, uh, the analysis and also they'll see it becomes very convoluted, but also the, the, it's not very good to have all the lipids with the yeah, throwing into the mass spectrometers. So then after we, uh, we got rid of the lipids and we did this by uh, absorption through absorption via zirconia beads. And then we carry out the enzymatic digestion, uh, then identify the, the peptides using LC, and then we carry out the mass spectrometry when we can, uh, we can see the shift in mass of specific like peptides where we uh, assign them the masses and we see whether there's the uptake of deuterium. Finally, we develop also software in order to analyze our, our data. And you can see here that we can plot our data in the so-called Woods plots when we have in x-axis the residue number the, uh, of, of the protein and then y-axis we have the difference in maps in the difference in, in mass and then this is differential experiment comparing lipid mix a versus lipid mix b and we can see that uh, like a positive mass difference in masses it reflects deprotected areas which is like uh, 
destabilization shown in red and the negative difference in masses uh, reflects uh, protected areas, which is like, uh, 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 like stabilization of, of the protein. And that's something that we're gonna see quite a lot from now on in my presentation. This is very good example for transporters because transporters, they carry out specific movements. So there was, it was quite, uh, how do you call it, monitorable a system that we can monitor very easily in, in terms of how we can see the difference in, in HTX mass spectrometry. For instance, here at the top of the bottom left, you can see that we have like the red beads mean, means opening of a transporter where the blue areas mean that we have closing of the transporter on this uh, regions. So we're going to see a little bit more examples as we go on with our presentation. So I will talk a little bit about the sugar transporters and the xyli transporter, that's a xylos uh, transporter that was operating with alternating access mechanism where the substrate, xylos, and the proton, the bind on the one side of the membrane, and then they move uh, to the other side of the membrane. And they are, we have like two main conformations that happening is the outward facing conformation, and then we have like the inward facing conformation. This type of conformation are quite difficult to study with cryo-electron microscopy. The reason for that is because they are sy symmetrical and it's difficult to, to tell the orientation with cryo em but in, in, in with HTX mass spectrometry, we can map that uh, information quite easily. So Xyli is an important target because we can provide us a mechanistic understanding of how sugars uh, bind to transport, how they transport it from one side of the membrane to the other. And also because it's homologous to uh, GLUT1, as I said before, we say, is responsible for glucose supply to the brain and other organs in our, in our body. So the key features within the family, which is the xyli and GLUT1, they maintain in that way, by proxy, we can study, uh, and make a, have a mechanistic understanding of disease of the human uh, transporter. So the very first experiment we did in our group was to see if we can capture the tra transported state. So we, we designed a, a rather dummy experiment. So we had a, a differential HTX mass spectrometry to see uh, how the, we had as one state the wild type a transporter, the wild type Xyli transporter, which alternates between different states. And then the average state was something like is an occluded state. So neither open on, on the, uh, neither outward facing conformation nor like an inward facing conformation. And then we did a mutation by replacing the glycine to the bulky tryptophan in, in, at, the, at the area where it's precluding the transporter to close on the extracellular side. So in that way, we wanted to map whether HTX mass spectrometry can actually provide us uh, like information in a very controllable experiment. And as you can see here, by comparing the mutant versus the wild type, so we can map that have like a red beads on the extracellular side and the, and, the, uh, and the blue beads on the intracellular side. It means that the transporter was indeed open, open on the extracellular side as we expected from the mutation and closing in the intracellular side. And this is actually gave us confidence that the method can very clearly work for something that is very much controllable. So similar to that, we can also uh, do experiments by leak and binding when we can lock the transporter in specific conformations, or, or we can uh, carry out static classes as I described just before, we can do cross-linking experiments with a system, for instance. So, Having done this first experiment, then we moved into uh, understanding a little bit more biological question with respect to transporters. So the major facilitator superfamily has a signature motif, the motif A, which is a charge relay network, which is sitting in the intracellular gate of transporters, as you can see here. So, so we hypothesized that if we mutate out this uh, 
uh, this gate, intracellular gate, that we can shift the, the transporter from one conformation to another, basically from the outward facing conformation or the extracellular side uh, towards the uh, uh, inward facing conformation. So indeed, we carry out mutation, uh, and then we do mutations that sitting in this intra uh, intracellular gate. And by comparing with the wild type, we can see in both cases that we have shifted the conformation from one side to the other side. And this is obvious from the, from the blue and the red bits on the either side of the transporter. That's uh, quite reassuring again. It tells us like, actually we can uh, study biological mechanisms using this type of HDX mass spectrometry technique. So the, the next question that we wanted to ask ourselves was like, can we probe direct protein lipid interaction? So, so far, we saw this experiment that without manipulating any lipid environment, but we can see that we have this network of, uh, uh, that the charge relay network can play an important role into the transported dynamics. So we carry out experiments by reconstituting the xylose transporter into uh, two different lipid nanodisks. The first one was a mixture of P, PG, and cardiolipin, and the second one was a PC, PG, and cardiolipin. Basically, we the, the first one, the PE-based uh, nanodisks, are the physiologically relevant, while the PC-based is, is, is not physiologically relevant, and we in that way that we can monitor what's the effect of P lipids into the protein dynamics. So we use the PC-based nanodisc as a control because we expect to, to be idle in a way, so it's not gonna have any major impact on, on the transporter. So we, for this, we carry out differential experiments between the P-based and the PC-based nanodiscs on the wild type Xyli. And we can see here that we have a conformational opening towards the inward facing conformation with, you can see the blue bits on the top and the red bits on the bottom of the transporter. And we carry out also similar experiments, another uh, transporter of the same class of major facilitator superfamily. So that's the lactose permease transporter. The LACY is a very well studied, well characterized transporter that we wanted to see whether we have similar effects that can, 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 be, uh, can work across the same family of transporters. And indeed, we have like similar uh, signature, conformation signature with the shifting of the conformation from, um, from, the in, from the outward phase to the inward phase conformation. So obviously so far we can, with this experiment, we can tell that the lipid environment does matter. For, for the conformation. And specifically, we can tell that PE has an effect in shifting the conformation dynamics of a transporter. However, we don't know whether this effect is because it's of direct protein lipid interactions or because we have like uh, the environment, it's the lipid sitting there as an environment can actually have an impact of, uh, of, of on the protein. So, in order to answer this question, and because also we hypothesize that there is some sort of interaction between the PE lipid and the protein, we carry out MD simulations with our collaborators in, in, in Illinois, in Urbana-Champaign, and Professor Tatskosit. And we found with the simulations that we have specific interactions of PE lipids on the charge relayed network that we have identified as important of shifting the dynamics from one state of the transporter to the other state of the transporter. And that was give us a little bit of more hypothesis in, in our story that actually it's very likely that we are like binding on this intracellular gate and they're shifting the equilibrium from one state to another. But in order to be 100% certain of that, then we mutated out this um, uh, and the, the protein at this intracellular gate. And then we carry out experiments between differential experiments between P and again, and PC based nanodisc. And in this case, we saw no effect whatsoever, no difference in our HDX experiment that actually provided confidence that, that this is the direct protein lipid interaction that provides us the, uh, the 
the, it's important for biological function and the functional dynamics that we see in a transporter. So moving ahead, another question that we wanted to answer was how the allosteric coupling between ligand binding and protonation is working, and how the different, uh, whether substrate and inhibitor has an effect on, on xylee transporters. So what we did, we uh, carry out mutations mimicking the protonation by using uh, at, uh, negatively charged, mutating neg negatively charged residues to uh, uncharged residues. And uh, we have identified two specific uh, residues, that's the D27 and the E206. And we carry out a number of experiments, edge sticks, mass spec experiments, where we use both inhibitor glucose and also the substrate xylose, both in the well type, but also in the combination of single or double mutations. So the first is question that I wanted to answer was, what is the effect of protonation of xylee dynamics? So we compare the single mutant versus the wild type. And we can see on the top of this, uh, uh, on this slide that we have a single protonation triggers more a closed state. This is evident from the blue areas on both sides of the transporter. However, that's quite interesting that when we carry out differential experiments of double mutation, that means double protonation, then we can uh, trigger like a, a dynamic change towards an equal facing state. As you can see that with the blue at the top and the red at the bottom. Well, it's, it's obvious that the double protonation has a significant effect on the dynamics. We don't know which one is, is, the, is the most important. So then we carry out uh, experiments to see the effect of of D27 Newton or the effect of E206 Newton. So we did compare the double mutation versus the single mutation. We can see here that the D27 Newton has actually shifted the equilibrium towards the inward facing state. Well, it's not the same with the E206. So we, we concluded that the D27 uh, is, the, is the driver for the structural changes in, uh, in the Xylee transporter. So the next question was, are there any differences between substrate and inhibitor? So this is, in, this is like quite an important question because we have crystal structures that have shown that uh, uh, the xylose and glucose bound to the transporter, they have similar conformation despite the fact that one is substrate and the other inhibitor. So what we carry out experiments on the uh, with glucose or xylose bound on glucose inhibitor plus the protonated sites. And you can see here that on the glucose, then we have like uh, when it bounds on the top of the slide, then we have like an outward facing conformation, reds on the top, blues on the bottom. And when we have a, a xylose bound, which is the substrate, then we have something like which is more like open, more, more dynamic conformation when we have like reds in both sides of the transporter. So we wanted to see whether we can corroborate these uh, results with, it, with MD simulations. And again, with our collaborators in Illinois, we carry out experiments with a similar type of uh, xylose and glucose bound at the protonated stage. And we can see that in case of xylose and in line with our HDX mass spec experiments, we have way more flexibility, way more dynamic motions. Well, in, the, in, the, in case of glucose, we have way more, way more stable uh, structure of, of, the, of the transporter. So that allows us to go and put together a substrate dependent energy lab scale in the Xylee transporter when we have the resting state, the, the protein is uh, protonated in the 206 is the one that it doesn't drive the structural changes. And then we have the substrate bound or the remaining on the outward facing state and the transition state happening when we have the protonation D27 and then transition from the outward face to the inward facing state. When the P lipids bound, then they, 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 they retain the conformation to the inward facing state. And then we have the removal of uh, substrate and proton in order the transporter to go back to the resting state. So in that case, we can uh, 
we do two things on these studies that we can see the effect of lipids in the whole transport cycle, but also can identify what, what is the sequence of events, what is happening first and what's happening second in terms of protonation and substrate binding. We also put together inhibitor dependent energy, energy landscape in our protein. And we can see that we have again, the, the protein in the resting state, uh, protonated on the 206, and then the inhibitor bounds, locks the transporter in the outflow facing state, and then we have protonation in D27, but because we have the, uh, the, pro, the inhibitor bound there, this doesn't have any conformation change towards the inward facing state. And that's quite important as a next step to study the dynamic sig signature of inhibitors or substrates, but also other drugs in, in the GLUT1 to see whether there's like some similar functions in, um, in, a, in, in, in a human homolog of, uh, of xylate transporter. So I'm going to very quickly go through a couple of other examples that can show you a little bit the power of our methods. So the, for this challenging uh, membrane protein, so we studied uh, efflux pumps like ACRB and MACB. And ACRB is, is very well characterized uh, multi-drug efflux transporter. So it plays a significant role in the antibiotic resistance. We're talking about the phenotype of E. coli and they export a wide variety of toxic compounds. And the drugs are exported by functioning rotation mechanism where the protein is a trimer and alternates between three different states um, uh, where, where the drugs either bound to the to the to the conformation or they're like released or they also they have two different binding sites which is the proximal and distal uh, binding site so we wanted to see in our studies what is the structural effect of antibiotic and inhibitor of the transporter so we carry out experiments with antibiotic that's the ciprofloxacin which is the uh, we call it SIP, and also with a known flux inhibitor. So as you can see, we have uh, antibiotic inhibitor stably bind to ACRB. We can identify the binding site. When the synergy, when we have just the, the antibiotic on the top, we can see some changes. When we have also the inhibitor, we see more blues, which means that inhibits the function of transport, stabilizes a bit more the, the transport and that's expected. But what was very interesting in the bottom, which plot that we can see here, that the synergy of both the antibiotic and the inhibitor makes the, the, the transport more conformational restraint. And that actually is, is an important finding that when we have both of those two, they having more inhibitory effect than the inhibitor itself, or inhibitor on its own. So, the next step was to see whether we have a clinical mutation that has been identified before that's a G2288D, which is a multi-drug resistant clinical isolate. It has been identified to a patient who's, who died uh, during antimicrobial treatment. So we carry out again experiments on the mutant now by comparing uh, uh, initially uh, with drugs uh, like antibiotic, but also inhibitor, but the synergy of those two. And we can see in this case that we, when we have the synergy of both antibiotic and the inhibitor, there's not that this conformation restraint that we've seen previously, and we have more red regions, so it means that there's more conformation flexible, and that can actually, uh, the, this eradication of the synergistic effect between the drug and the inhibitor can explain why we have this uh, outcome in the patient during the antimicrobial treatment. I'm not sure how I'm doing in terms of time, but I, I don't think I have too much time, maybe a few minutes. So uh, another transporter that we study was the MACB, that's an ABC transporter, again, uh, uh, related to a flux of antibiotics, but also an enterotoxin out of the cell. So in the, ex in the first experiment, we wanted to see, and this is driven by ATP, wanted to see that if the ATP bound to the protein has an effect in conformation dynamics. And you can see on the top here that we have crystal structures with ATP bound and ATP free to the, to the right and ATP bound to the left. And when they have the bind of ATP, that's conformation and zipping of the transporter. 
so we, we, towards a closed state. And that actually, by comparing in HDX, we can see like the excessive blue regions, both in the mid part of the transporter and also on the, on the top and the bottom. And that consistent with what we see, the difference between the two crystal structures and that quite good example, how the method can capture this dynamic effect of ATP bound on the MACP transporter. We also be able to carry out experiments uh, with drug that erythromycin, but experiments, differential experiments with and without drugs. Here you can see that with our method, we can identify the drug binding site on the top of the transporter, but also we can have the ATP binding site that's the blue red regions in the bottom of the transporter. So the ongoing work on this project involves like understanding the synergy of drugs and with enterotoxin and trying to identify what is the binding site. But here I showcase to you that how uh, this method can, can actually not only understand the, the functional dynamics of transport or of membrane proteins, but also can identify very clearly binding sites of uh, drugs. Um, obviously, that, that's a control experiment when we try a, a drug that is known that it doesn't bound to the transporter, such as the carbenicillin, and that shows here with a good plot that we don't have any, any, any changes, so any significant changes that actually give us quite a lot of confidence that what we see in our experiments with drug binding is real. So moving forward, and I'm going to spend the last few minutes of my talk to explain a little bit like what we're doing currently in my group, and that's trying to study more eukaryotic systems, and in particular, G protein coupled receptors, which is a very important target implicated in nearly all physiological functions, but also many pathologies. And the long-term goal is to mechanistic understanding of ligand-induced dynamics and G protein coupling selectivity. So we want to build also some a platform using HTX as a main tool to do ligand profiling in native conditions. So the steps that we take is to, the first step is to try to have a, a tool that we can get in vitro characterization of GPCRs. So basically we identify hotspots of changes in GPCRs. So GPCRs are a little bit more complicated systems in conformation as speaking as compared to transporters because they, we have a subtle changes into the dynamics. You know, with transporters, we have very long, large conformational changes that we can, we can easily monitor, but with GPCRs, it's a little bit more difficult. We, in the second step, we want to test different drug compounds, such as agonists, partial agonists, or antagonists, and see what's the conformational signatures that these uh, drugs can give to the transporters. And finally, we want to, obviously, in the long run, to to carry out in vivo validation of these uh, experiments. So we use the beta-1 adrenergic receptor as a model system, and that's a collaboration with OMAS Therapeutics, a spin-off company from Oxford. And it has been quite a challenging system because it's very unstable, um, uh, it, and it, it's quite difficult to work with. Uh, we have a time window to work with them. They can be, they aggregate, they're very heterogeneous, so, it's quite a difficult experiment to carry out and, uh, and get, get a good coverage. So in our first step, it was to see whether there is any significant differences between agonists, adagonists, and partial agonists. And you can see here that we try different ad adagonists on, on the beta-1 adrenergic receptor, and we can have like similar conformational effects. So we can see, for instance, the blue region is TM5, transmembrane helis 5 is the binding site. We can spot clearly the binding of different uh, adagonists, but also we can see specific conformation changes su such as the ECL2 loop here on the, on, the, uh, on the outside side of the membrane. So that's protection that's happening. So what is quite interesting that in the in case of agonists, we have a completely different signature that we see red beads is particular in the ICL1 region that's here we have tried two different agonists. We retained the, the binding of the transmembrane Helis 5, as we can see previously with ad agonists. In some cases, also the ECL2 loop that's become stabilized, but also we have 
significant uh, changes in the intracellular part of the receptor, as you see the, the, the red beads, and that's consistent with conformational activation of the receptor upon agonist binding. And that gives us like a, a clear signature of agonist. We have been quite interested on this ICL loop, ICL1 loop, which is related with the binding of the receptor to the G protein. And this is activated upon, in order to prepare the receptor to bind with the G protein coupling. And that's happening mostly with in cases of, of partial agonists, but also with agonists. Here we can see again with the partial agonists, we have the uh, ICL1, but also other ICL3 loops. And what we can conclude from that, that we have a, a when we compare a agonist versus agonist, a partial agonist, we have a significant uh, changes. We can see here that we, in case of ICL1 loop, we have a conformation stabilization in the case of agonist, but in case of agonist and partial agonist, we have conformation destabilization as red beads. We can see and that can lead us to. Uh, maybe with, with, we're trying to understand how the mechanism and that might be related with the breaking of the ionic leg in, lock in this area of the, of the receptor. But beyond that, we, we're trying to understand is like how we can tell like whether we have a, a clear confirmation signature between agonists and antagonists. Obviously, this is an ongoing work that we carry out in our group. So. And the open questions, obviously, is like what's the regulatory mechanism of G protein coupling, and also the role of lipids, but also uh, building a high throughput platform that we can use HDX to study the conformation signatures of G protein cap receptors. I think I'm going to be concluding. I have a few slides to tell, but I'm going to skip from this project because it's good to give some time for questions. So here is some of the publications we have. Uh, studying in the, we have published the last few years from my group focusing primarily on, on HDX mass spectrometry, but also we have done some work with native but and also ion mobility mass spectrometry. We have developed also a software, the Deutero software, which can be used to for rapid analyzing and uh, and do statistical analysis of HDX mass spec data. So one of the as I said in the beginning, one of the bottlenecks in HTX mass spec analysis is like, uh, we can do the experiments within a couple of days, but then when we have like a, a particular many peptides and complicated systems, then we can have like, a, the analysis can take like weeks or in some cases even a month or two months to analyze the data, depending on the size and the number of peptides and the number of time points that we analyze. So. Having a software that can do that quickly and also provide us with uh, rigid statistics was very important aspect that we developed in our group and we keep developing uh, uh, as a supporting software for our uh, HDX mass spec analysis. So I would like to acknowledge all the people that uh, did the work in my group, but also collaborators and the funders, uh, mostly in the UK and thank you for your attention and I'm obviously happy to take any questions. Thanks, that's a really exciting talk and you can see the power of the technique to study the very dynamic protein structures. So um, I'll just open for questions from the audience first before I have, a, have lots of questions to ask, but we can save that for later. <laughs> Anyone? Uh, you can just unmute yourself if you have a question, or you can type. Yes. Um, I have a question, but uh, yeah, I, might, yeah. I might have been missed it. How do you know for sure if it's specific versus non-specific uh, interaction? For example, in case of ligands? Oh, well, I mean, this is... Um, um, I guess we, we know, in case of ligand, we cannot tell whether it's a per se specific or non-specific interaction, right? We, we monitor whether we have a, a, a conformation change upon ligand binding. Obviously we can tell two things, right? So whether the ligand, okay, let's me put it that way. It's difficult to only with HDX to, 
to distinguish between ligand binding to identify the binding site and the allosteric effect that might have, right, the binding. So because obviously if we don't have some other information where might bind, right, we don't know whether it's like allostery or binding site, right? So we need some extra information. For instance, with the GPCR, right? So we're very clear because we know that GPCRs agonist antagonist, the bound of the transmembrane hill is five, that's known. Knowledge, and we have a clear signal there that there is like a, a protection. So we're very much, very much certain that it, that's that it, it reproduced in all experiments, right? So we're very much certain that this is a binding site that we can see. So, and also we have conformational change, allosteric changes that's happening. So I guess the specificity or not of interaction is very much dependent also on the system we study and the primary knowledge that we have rather than it's more like a generic thing that we can tell in general with the method, right? No, because the reason why I was asking, it, it's quite an impressive techniques and it seems quite fast. As you mentioned, the data analysis can be somewhat uh, time consuming, but I mean, it will, I, my guess it will improve in the future and it will be easier to handle these things. But um, I was wondering how, like in the future, in terms of high throughput, it seems it can be very useful for like drug screening trials yeah. in the future, right? This is what you're aiming for eventually, mm -hmm. I guess. So, so do you think what kind of throughput you can expect with your technique in the future? Like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I guess the high throughput at the moment, it's, it's a very strong word for that because obviously high throughput means that we can screen yeah, yeah, like thousand, thousand drugs per day, right? So this yeah, is yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing that. that. Yes, yeah. but in the future, like I mean, it, it seems to yeah. be quite fast in identifying what are the binding sites and everything. So from yeah. my understanding, yeah, I mean, there, there's a little bit of uh, there are some uh, bottlenecks there. It depends on whether you're doing that in a lipid-based environment, in native environment. So then you need to find a way to uh, to to get rid of the lipids. For instance, if you do something in a, you know, from, um, you know, how to call it in situ, right? So HTX, when you have a, a, how it's not purified protein with too many stuff in there, right? So that needs some kind of developments in order to get rid of the lipids or other stuff. Otherwise your signal is gonna be very convoluted. You also have to minimize a, a lot of the LC time because if it's LC time now, the gradient we run is eight minutes. If you do eight minutes per drug, it's going to take you forever. So we need to get like to down to one minute or seconds even. And so that, that, that's quite a, and also will be a little bit useful if, for instance, you know exactly which areas have the conformation changes. For instance, GPCRs, we know that the intracellular part is like, activates and we know the binding site if we study specific peptides then can improve the can be much faster so it's, it's a little bit tricky actually yeah to do that in a, in a high throughput manner eight minutes i'll say is not bad we do like an hour two hour here often okay, yeah. but if <laughs> well, you want to screen 100 yeah that, i know yeah, yeah i get it yeah uh, uh, obviously we cannot do long care right actually there's limitation even in, in the long care because we this back exchange, right? So the, the 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 more time you leave it in LC, that you can have a back yeah. exchange. So you, yeah. that's yeah. why the gradient is is so is short in terms of time. Yeah. 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 Gary, cool. uh, next. Uh, oh uh, yeah, I I just uh, yeah nice talking. I'm just trying to wrap my head on the physics of of these experiments. I'm being a mass spectroscopist, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But I guess your limited kind of your resolution is limited by the size of your protein digestions, right? If I'm yeah. Correct. yeah. So is there, you really can't tell if it's, a, you know, if it's in the inside or outside. Is there any, you know, I guess you're probably working on ways where you can refine the uh, lower the resolution, uh, smaller yeah, but, uh, yeah that, that's a very good question. I, I think there are ways to refine that. And uh, there are two ways to do that. The first way is like we can, you know, like, you know, obviously digestion gives us a lot of peptides, right? So they can be like the, how do you call it? We call it redundancy, how many overlapping peptides we have. If we have many overlapping peptides, then we can 
computationally work out the differences between those. So they, for instance, if we, let's say we have 100 peptides and we go suddenly into 500 peptides, then we can have way more information. We can work out better resolution, if you know what I'm saying, right? So that's one way to do, but then that requires a lot of optimization in terms of buffers you're using. For instance, with, a, HD, with membrane proteins, we're using detergents. It requires optimization with the type of proteases we're using. Uh, and we have actually used proteases that can improve significantly the number of peptides. Uh, that's one way to go ahead with that in, in order to improve the resolution. Uh, the other way is you can use methods like ETD or ECD, right? So we can actually target specific peptides and, and then you can go down to residue level resolution, right? But that's kind of more laborious and you can do, not do ETD or ECD to the whole protein. You have to have like targeted peptides, right? Realistically speaking. So th that's sort of experiments we can do for improve the resolution, yeah. Uh, thank you. This, this is maybe just another dumb question, maybe dumb. Uh, yeah, when you add acid to quench it, is that denaturing things? Just how just physically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's okay. It's just simple denaturation. Okay. Obviously, uh, once we quench it, uh, we chop the, uh, you know, the, we can do whatever with the protein. The, the only thing that we, we, we care after that is we don't want to have back exchange. Because once we stop the reaction, we freeze the system, right? So, but we won't keep this system frozen until we reach the mass spec, right? So that, that we don't lose the information. That's why everything has to happen in lower pH. That's why we use pepsin as acidic conditions. And also we, we have the, it's a refrigerated the system. So it's a low temperature, right? We do it on ice stuff. Like, all right. in order yeah. not to, yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Maybe I'll just ask a quick one. So and some membrane proteins can be glycosylated. So have you investigated in like uh, applying this to like glyco membrane proteins and see how the dynamic aspect can be captured? And so was there mean, some Okay, glycosylation. Yeah, glycosylation. Like yeah. Usually glycosylation, they have an effect of not getting coverage, right? On, um, they're protected from the glycans, right? So, so when we study, uh, that's, that's mostly happening in the human membrane proteins, they're heavily glycosylated. So there's a couple of ways to go around that. So we can deglycosylate them in order to improve the coverage on HDX. But then obviously this needs to be tested whether deglycosylation has an effect on the, on the functionality of the protein because the glycans are there in order to provide some functionality. So uh, obviously this, then it's interesting the question, what's the difference between glycosylation versus deglycosylation as in, in the dynamics, right? But uh, yeah, uh, I, I mean, usually we haven't really studied too much. We're trying to avoid glycosylation because uh, introduce like an extra hassle in our experiments and actually we don't get coverage of this area of, of the glycosylated peptides. So, but it's a, there are some groups that are doing quite, I know Casper Rand in Copenhagen are doing quite a lot of work in developing methods that you actually, um, you can um, carry the, on the experiments, right? You, you quench and then before you do the LC, you deglycosylate, right? So, and then you actually, you, you, you freeze the system on the gly glycosylated state, but then you deglycosylate before you analyze the data. So you actually, you, you see what I'm saying? So yeah, 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 rather yeah. than deglycosylate de before the, the incubation and the deuteration, you do it in the in-between in step. But that's not quite, it's not super easy because you have to do it yeah. quick and you have to do it efficiently, right? Yeah. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So if there are no other questions, let's uh, thank uh, Julius uh, for the nice talk. And uh, I know some, most of us have follow-ups meetings with him. And if you want to talk with him and just let me know, we can put it into any of the some of the meetings. Yeah. Thanks again, Agris. Thanks so much. Yeah. I'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.